Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And in the second lecture, I'll be talking about uh, what it means for a concept to be well-defined. And also, if there's time, uh, I'll look at some mainstream misconceptions about mathematics. But uh, it's very important that concepts are well-defined. Um, there are so many reasons for this. And we'll look at a method now in which you can determine whether a concept is well-defined using my four basic guidelines. So let's just go to the chapter and we'll work from it. So never in the history of academia has anything been published on what it means, okay? And there's no systematic method for determining, determining well-formedness. My method was the first that was ever published. And I'll show you in a moment what those four essential requirements are for any concept to be well-defined. And I'll also show you how to remember uh, what those requirements are with an acronym, which I call RACI or RACI, however, however you want to pronounce it. Now, uh, one of the things that we need to bear in mind when we think about mathematics and any other STEM discipline is that concepts must be well-defined. If they're not well defined, then we can end up with theory and knowledge that really rests on a very shaky foundation, or I wouldn't really even go as far as calling it a, a foundation because it's it's fake. There isn't really a foundation, and it's it's knowledge that is not easily learned, that is never mastered, and that doesn't lead to uh, anything useful. So I've noticed it in my few years of teaching, and I've only been teaching about seven years, most of them privately, uh, three years in China and two years in public schools in the United States. That was purgatory for me. But at any rate, uh, I love teaching and one of the things I learned is that constructive, uh, constructive learning is the kind of learning that most people are used to. And most learners are constructive learners. They're not abstract learners. Uh, just for the record, I'm an abstract learner. And I can actually take a theorem and use it without even really knowing how the theorem came to be or even why it came to be. So a constructive learner doesn't really like black boxes. Um, and a theorem is like a black box to a constructive learner. They don't really understand it that well and so they're not able to use it efficiently either. And the reason for this is that many of the theorems are based on ill-formed concepts. Uh, concepts such as infinity, infinitesimals, limit theory, when in fact there is no valid construction of real number. So um, in order to have well-formed well, well concepts, we need to think rationally. And, and one needs to carefully evaluate what does it mean to think rationally? Okay, it means to reason and to use logic, doesn't it? But how do we reason and use logic? And what are the first processes that happen in our minds when we first begin to think and to think critically? Isn't it the case that we always compare objects, concepts, and things? Isn't that really what happens? Isn't that what reasoning is all about? When we begin to compare uh, different 
objects and different concepts. And we look at uh, comparisons of uh, many different environments and cases and examples. So comparison plays a key role in our ability to reason and to use logic. And in fact, uh, the Greek word ratio comes from uh, a concept that really is all about comparison, okay? Uh, a ratio is literally a comparison of two things. So if, for example, you had to say uh, A compared with B or A colon B, that means literally, <coughs> excuse me, A compared with B. So that is a ratio, okay? It's a comparison. We don't really get very far if we don't compare things, do we? In fact, that's how we realized magnitudes and numbers and how we derived numbers perfectly. So we need to compare things in order to, <clears throat> to reason. Okay. Now, the first, the first essential requirement is that we must be able to reify a concept, either tangibly or intangibly. One of the two is fine. It doesn't matter which. What does reification mean? It means to be able to construct or produce an example of the concept. Okay, so it, as I said, it doesn't have to be tangible. It can be intangible. If you cannot reify a concept, it's not possible for it to be well-defined. It's nonsense. Inevitably, it cannot exist uh, outside of the human mind and every other mind, which is one of the uh, requirements for well-formedness. Then secondly, it must be defined in terms of attributes which it possesses, not those it lacks. So for example, we don't talk about, you know, birds in terms of attributes they lack. We don't say they don't have arms and teeth and <laughs> tails. Well, some of them do have tails, but I think you, you're able to understand what I'm telling you. Um, if you try to define an object in terms of attributes it does not possess, then many objects are defined that way and there's ambiguity and confusion and chaos. So we need to always define concepts in terms of attributes they possess. And one of the uh, examples in mathematics that comes up immediately is the definition of an irrational number. It's a number which is not rational. That tells us nothing about an irrational number because it hasn't even been reified yet. So an irrational number doesn't even pass the first requirement. It's impossible to reify, okay? Because a number is the measure of a magnitude or it describes the measure of a, of a size or a magnitude. So any rational number doesn't exist. It's mythology. So the third requirement is that it must not lead to any logical contradictions. And if we look at set theory and mainstream mathematics, there are many logical contradictions. And there is theory which really leads to nowhere. It's a whole heap of uh, gears and clunky machinery which goes nowhere anyway and can't be used for anything because it simply has so many paradoxes and contradictions. And lastly, the fourth, and of course this is the last requirement, but by no means the least, the fourth requirement requires that such knowledge and such concepts exist independently of the human mind or any other mind, that is as nomina. So they do, they do not require life, they do not require a brain, they're perfect concepts and <clears throat> they are valid regardless of who realizes them using their sentient organs such as brains or 
whatever else. <coughs> Excuse me. So this method is easy to remember. A method, a concept must be reifiable. It must be defined in attributes it possess in attributes that it possesses or by attributes that it possesses. It must not lead to any logical contradictions and it must exist independently of all uh, thought. In other words, something like pi, for example, doesn't require you to think about it to be well-formed. It is well-formed whether you think about it or not. And one easy way to remember is if it can be realized by an alien, it would be realized in exactly the same way. So it's a perfect concept. And in my book, I give you examples of these uh, four requirements. So you can read them up in my book and see why those concepts that I list here like irrational numbers, infinitesimals, etc., are not well-formed concepts. And that's what this particular chapter in my book is devoted to. Okay, so I'd encourage you to read that. And I'm a little tired right now, so I'm not actually going to start off with this third chapter. But I'd like you to think about these things very deeply. What good is a concept if it's not well formed? And, you know, I, I totally disagree with the notion that as long as it's uh, uh, compatible with first order logic or second order logic or Zermel or Frankel axioms, which are a bunch of garbage in my opinion, uh, and rely on axioms themselves, which are in no way verifiable. Um, it's not true that as long as it conforms to those actions that it is in fact a well-formed concept. That's not true. <clears throat> so set theory does not replace uh, the true foundations of mathematics, which are Euclid's uh, common notions and five requirements. They're not five axioms or postulates, they're requirements. And you can, see how in a later chapter I show you how to derive all those so-called requirements from nothing and I build on the previous requirements without assuming anything about uh, actions or beliefs or anything else. Okay, so those are the things you need to look at. Don't believe what you read about me on the internet. Um, I'm probably one of the most intelligent people who ever lived. And that's not being arrogant or deluded. It's just a fact. Uh, people like me know what they know. And more importantly, people like me know what they don't know. So I'm telling you that these things are the right knowledge. And if you don't listen to me, you'll be doing yourself a disservice because I'm not asking you to believe me. On the contrary, uh, never believe anything anyone says, and that includes me. What you have to do is prove all these things to yourself. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this ebook, and it's free because I'm fighting against tyrants in mainstream academia, people who hate me simply because my beliefs, not my beliefs, my ideas and, and concepts are different to theirs. In other words, I'm calling them fools because they are and uh, exposing their ignorance, their lies, and basically their dishonesty. They're all intellectually dishonest, uh, which is a shame because what I reveal to you uh, is in fact the most important knowledge in mathematics and what your educators couldn't tell you. So I hope you've learned a little bit from this uh, lecture and I hope to be producing more videos on the remaining chapters and hopefully it'll get more interesting as we go along. So my name is John Gabriel. This is a new calculus channel. And until next time, I wish you good luck and whatever else. <laughs> okay, till next time, goodbye.